Asian businessmen, for example, like to come here because we are an Asian city, but we're also a global city. At the same time, it's easy to do business. Singapore's doors are always open to welcome the rich, the wealthy, the people who want to have the security and want to be feel good and comfortable. Singapore is a playground for the mega rich, the place to park their wealth. As people get more affluent, you want to look at more luxury items, better homes, better cars, better yachts. Well, as long as they flaunt it within the rules of the law, I think it's fine. Billionaires, tycoons and big foreign firms are drawn here by the low taxes, stable government and protective banking lords that keep their accounts secret. So I think Singapore will be the location where people custody their assets. What the Swiss have done for many, many years and done successfully, uh, Singapore has simply taken that to another level. But with the rising costs of living, many Singaporeans are struggling. We have uh, one of the most expensive public housing in the world. I think the core issue is that Singaporeans are finding it increasingly difficult to compete for jobs. I'm Joram Barose. On this edition of 101 East, we ask who really benefits from living in the world's richest city. There's no shortage of style or fun in the sun at the Singapore Yacht Show. Touted as the gateway to Asia's elite, visitor numbers have doubled since the show began three years ago. Truly Singapore is becoming one of the most important hubs. We have a lot of new clients, a lot of new uh, entrepreneurs, and a lot of new high net worth individuals which are uh, uh, just now thinking that a boat, a yacht can be part uh, of their luxury living. In a sea of sales, Alessandro Torelli is selling this yacht for $5.2 million. A yachting can give you the freedom, can give you the privacy and no any kind of luxury hotel can provide such a luxury and freedom in the same time. Is it also a status symbol? It is also a status symbol, surely. Forget jets and limos if you want to travel in style. The dazzling array of super yachts are the draw cards here. They can even be chartered for a cool $50,000 a week. This provides you a platform to have the time of your life. People are now becoming more aware of their surroundings and I would argue that Southeast Asia has some of the most beautiful coastline in the world. Arthur Tay's marina hosts the yacht show on Sentosa, an island off Singapore's coast. He also has his own yacht and luxury goods firm. Arthur is showing around Malaysian gaming tycoon Lim Kok Tay. There's more toys to buy here than just boats. I think Asia is now uh, developing into the next level of uh, pursuing more leisure uh, uh, expectation. It's probably the current continent where people are getting wealthier. Singapore is positioned as a fun place to be, also where business uh, converge. These ritzy events are part of Singapore's dramatic makeover, from colonial backwater to economic powerhouse in just 50 years. By throwing the doors open to super-rich foreigners, the country now manages 5% of the world's total private wealth, making Singapore the world's wealthiest city based on per capita income. It's very clear that uh, the efficiency part uh, the clarity that our government leaders have said that we want to position Singapore as the premier hub for everything to happen here. Uh, relative to the size compared to India and China, uh, we play a very strategic role to be the jewel in the uh, Southeast Asian market. 
Some of the wealthy tycoons with a presence in Singapore include Facebook founder Eduardo Saverin, Australian mining magnate Gina Reinhardt, Malaysian entrepreneur Ong Beng Sang, and prominent US investor Jim Rogers. The results of this chair has been tremendous. Is that one of your big sellers? Or? Yes, this yeah. is one of our top sellers right now. Some of Singapore's wealthiest business leaders think their homeland has a lot to offer. Ron Sim is the founder and CEO of a massage chair manufacturer, Osim International. With an estimated net worth of $350 million, he says Singapore's reliability and resilience to global shocks makes it an attractive base. If you look at Singapore, say, last 30, 40 years, you know, I think there's political stability and that has led, you know, to a clear culture, a clear vision. Very pro-business, you know, very effective. The things here works. Since starting his business in the 1980s, Ron has expanded his range of lifestyle and healthcare products. Today, 90% of his business is done overseas in 28 countries. But he doesn't want to move his main office to a cheaper base like Thailand. I mean, they have their weaknesses in terms of governmental change, the coups which impact their, you know, their nations in some way. But there is another incentive why big businessmen base their empires here. In terms of taxes, I think Singapore is one you know, of the few you know, countries like Hong Kong with low tax. You know, I think the government here believe that uh, you know, the, a competitive tax is important. Singapore's corporate taxation of 17% at the highest rate is low compared with other advanced economies. So looking at what's happening uh, in the West, particularly uh, various countries in Europe, looking at United States around uh, the wealth transfer taxes or even just wealth taxes of any form, uh, those are getting seemingly more harsh by the month, right? Every week there's an announcement from some parliament about more taxes either envisioned or planned. Mikolas Rambos is the CEO of WealthX, a startup company that gathers intelligence on rich individuals globally for major banks and corporations. There are thousands of ultra-wealthy here, 1,300 or so Singaporeans themselves, people who have businesses in Singapore. But if you add to that the Indonesians who are here and who have been here for many years, the mainland Chinese, the Europeans who have money, uh, sometimes first or second generation, uh, there are thousands of people. You know, there's a reason that Singapore has the highest uh, density of supercars in the world. It's because that money is all here in Singapore. With half the world's economic output shifting to Asia by 2050, Chinese businessman Tom Tang is looking to capitalise in Singapore. His company, the Rainwood Group, is affiliated with one of China's offshore oil giants, but has expanded into selling lifestyle products like soft drinks, golf courses and this luxury super yacht. Why Chinese, the typhoon, and moved to Singapore? Because there's a great you know, percentage of the population in Singapore and Singaporean, they are actually a Chinese. And so from as a Chinese investor, we found lots of things in common. Do you think it is the Chinese influence that has led to this explosion of wealth? I won't actually completely deny on the point because of the population in China. And now China is really having an open policy. And there's lots of you know, the Chinese people you know, migrate to Singapore. Acquiring property in Singapore is a ticket into a global business community. In this year's Knight Frank Wealth Report on global properties, 400 influential financial experts said Singapore will remain Asia's most important city for their clients. Uh, we can't really say Singapore is a huge market in terms of the populations. Singapore is very easy for you to step in to formulate your product because of the whole country's system. But in terms of the luxury market, we actually taking a great advantage of the Singaporean these connections to the world. So we are still having a great confidence on that. Like many foreign companies, Rainwood is buying heavily into Singapore's property market. The company bought over 40 of these high-rise apartments at Hamilton Scotts, one of Singapore's most coveted addresses. 
You don't need to keep your Lamborghini, Ferrari, or in our case an Audi, in the basement garage. The best place to keep an eye on it is right here in the lounge room. This is one. Property dealer Mohammed Ismail Ghaffour is showing me around another luxury condominium called The Sale, where floor space is $2,000 per square foot. Other properties can be high as $6,000. Despite today's gloomy weather, the view of Singapore's business hub is impressive and increasingly expensive. 25% of all private property transactions in Singapore are purchased by foreigners. Looking at the property prices in the next 10 years, I'm extremely confident Singapore prices are going to stay stable and continuous growth. Simply because today the top four nations that invest in properties are ranked as Malaysia, our immediate neighbour to the north, followed by the Chinese and Indonesia and India. And if you look at it, they are all huge populations of a billion and hundreds of millions in Indonesia and a, a, a small percentage of them who invest in Singapore and that's why Singapore is always seen as a gold mine for property investment. Foreigners are also snapping up waterfront properties on Sentosa, where long-term leases avoid investment restrictions. But this influx of wealth has driven up property prices by 77% in the last decade. To stop a housing bubble, the government has increased stamp duty to 15% for foreign buyers this year. It has already deterred to some extent, I must say, because the volume of transactions have somewhat dropped compared to prior to these cooling measures and now by about 30 to 40 percent depending on some of those locations. But the good thing though here is this, the prices today are very much muted in its growth and it, in fact it become a bias market because sellers are not able to demand prices as they did a couple of years ago when there wasn't such a cooling measure. But while the rich enjoy a livable city praised for urban innovation, many locals are struggling with rising living costs and job competition. Nicholas Fang is a government approved MP, nominated by the public to bring independent views into parliament. The danger of the politics of envy is very high. Uh, and I think that it's, it's hard for some Singaporeans to imagine that they, are, they are in, will be able to aspire to that kind of uh, uh, level. Uh, of uh, lifestyle or living. So the impact or the presence of wealthy individuals who uh, may not necessarily be Singaporean uh, is become, making itself felt uh, in Singapore on a social level. These feelings were obvious at one of Singapore's biggest protests against a government white paper proposing to increase the population by up to 30% in 2030. With immigrants making up nearly half of that 6.9 million population figure, demonstrators said it would put more strain on public resources. The White Paper aimed to improve land use and infrastructure in a city-state of just 700 square kilometres. But current redevelopments like turning this old cemetery into an eight-lane highway and housing estate prompt many to question if growth is coming at the expense of Singapore's soul. What we are saying, we've got enough growth, please, government. Now is the time to see the quality of the growth itself. We don't want every place to be turned into a productive factory or office, but perhaps it's time to let some of the thing be just to offer a quality of life. Economist Song Seng Moon says Singaporeans have very different priorities to others living in nations crippled with job cuts and austerity. What bothers them more now, it's not about the jobs, uh, finding jobs. It's about way of life. It's about you know, working condition. It's about the whole point of living in Singapore now. Yes, you have a job, but it is the quality of life they're looking at. Do everyday local Singaporeans, do they identify with it or are they a bit concerned about the way the country's changing? It's a very good question. I mean, if you come here every year, you'll notice something different every time. You'll probably find that the change it's at a pace which probably would have left them behind. What they can relate to really is their housing estate. 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing, including Jason Lim and his family. He says the public property market is unaffordable 
because of inflation and competition from foreigners with permanent residency. Many of the middle class are saddled with huge mortgages that take decades to pay off. I will be about 70. I can't retire unless, you know, something miracle happens. It's a lifetime thing. While well, we have seen an inflation about, you know, about 100%, you know, over the past 10 years or so. Today, cars in Singapore can cost up to three times more than their actual worth because the government issues a certificate of use that expires within 10 years. Jason spends $800 a month paying off his car. The scheme, aimed at limiting car ownership to ease traffic congestion, increases a family's debt for years. Besides that, you need to pay the road tax, insurance, all right, and uh, the maintenance, I mean, which are pretty common. And of course, these costs are not cheap. All right, the insurance itself can cost you a couple of grand. As an audio-visual technician, Jason has a reliable source of income, but he doesn't think many of the middle class have the means to reach their ambitions. People are always associate high income with good quality life. It doesn't really come hand in hand together at this time in Singapore, right? Because like I say, the middle income are basically being able to meet their basic needs. Prominent blogger Leong Si Hian also lives in public housing. He describes the middle class in Singapore as the sandwich class. If you are lower income, there are some basic schemes available to help you. But if you are middle class, you don't qualify for any of these schemes. Even if your little public house that you bought has been increasing in value over the years, it may just be an illusion because you may retire with hardly any money because all your money and all your pension went into your public housing. Chef Benny Siotio has just opened the fifth branch of his restaurant chain aimed at middle class consumers. He serves Western dishes with a Singaporean twist. But Chef Benny says affordability matters more. His restaurants thrive during the economic crisis. But now times are tougher. If you open up a new uh, restaurant, uh, in six months, 80% will actually close down. Those uh, gourmet restaurants, uh, I really don't think that they are doing very well. Uh, this is my observation. Unless you are celebrity chefs. But if for a Singaporean to start a high-end restaurant, it's very, very tough. Benny wasn't always doing so well. He's a reformed drug addict who went to jail a number of times. Now he helps others. While most restaurants hire foreign workers, Benny employs Singapore's downtrodden. If they are able to get a job, I think uh, there's a good chance that they can actually uh, reform and survive in this society. If they uh, come out from prison, let's say, and uh, they don't have uh, a job, uh, most likely I would say that They'll go back to their old ways. One of his chefs, Gwenda Singh, recently spent time in juvenile prison. He's noticed that life in the new Singapore is tough. The prices are already rising. I don't know what to expect in time to come, but I'm definitely not living in Singapore. No way. I was actually thinking of places like Malaysia, where it's like two times cheaper. The Kukor Street Flats house one of Singapore's poorest communities. Resident Samsuri Mahari estimates six out of ten people here are unemployed. Samsuri earns 600 Singaporean dollars a month, the equivalent of 480 US dollars, doing odd jobs to provide for his wife and six children. He's applied for other jobs like airport cleaning, but he says the travel costs make it unaffordable. With the deduction of the transport and cost for my, my uh, food, I'll be back only, reach my family, about three to four hundred dollars the most. I will waste a lot of time to travel. It take me about one and a half hour to go and come back. He set up an outreach group called Perkek with other elders to address poverty on this estate. They help people like Siddhar Binti Yusof find government services or jobs. Sida has heart problems and lives in this one-room flat with her brother who suffered a stroke. 
Together they receive 280 US dollars in government assistance. Is it okay if let's say this uh, this group, the support group, link you to other service that can assist you with your economy? Let's say if we uh, offer you some a uh, light light job, flower arrangement at home. But my hand, I cannot grab this hand. Oh, cannot this grab. This hand is problem. This hand no problem. Oh, okay, okay. Because okay. I do an angiogram. So that means uh, about two years already. Oh. And my leg also I cannot walk. The group have had many successes in helping the community, including forming a soccer team and a schooling program for young children. It's helped stop late night antisocial behaviour like loose sniffing. I don't want to see the children down here in 10 or 15 years to be my neighbour over here. I like to secure this youth, the children's future. I don't want them to be as it like me. Kukor Street and underprivileged areas around Singapore don't have the grinding poverty seen in other parts of Asia. But as corporate pay packages rise here, wages among Singapore's lower classes have fallen by 10% over the past decade. Leong Se Hian says a larger social net is the solution to income inequality. The problem with Singapore is that we have so little basic uh, social protection for the low income. We don't have universal health care, we don't have pensions, uh, you know, we don't have uh, automatic welfare for people who are, say, disabled. Though increasing the social net for those at the bottom means an end to low taxation, the very driver bringing wealth. There's definitely uh, more talk now of, uh, uh, given the income inequality that we're experiencing, uh, to have more safety nets for, for the, especially the lower uh, income segments of, of the society. But, you know, everything has a cost, right? If, if you want to, to do more in that sense, then the money has to come from somewhere. And I think the, the question that we're asking now is that, are Singaporeans willing to pay uh, higher income tax? When it comes to the issue of a social net, Ron Sim can see both sides of the coin. Growing up in a struggling family of seven children, he worked odd jobs from the age of nine. To pay for university, he sold door-to-door -door products, worked on construction sites, and waited tables at a noodle stand. I think it depends on how you tax the people. I think it's okay to tax people, you know, the, which, are more, which are making more money in a sense, but it should not be a direct tax. You know, like I said, consumption tax is good, you know, it's okay to have more consumption tax in a sense. It's okay to have more transactional tax, you know, for certain levels of people uh, in certain property sector, I think that's fine. Uh, but in terms of corporate tax and personal tax, you do not want to drive the entrepreneurship away. Given the high quality of public services compared to the rest of the world, Singaporeans say there's a culture of expectation that is often hard to navigate. Sometimes the Singaporeans like to whinge a lot. There's some ground to say that perhaps Singaporeans are more pampered a lot than elsewhere. They can be very patriotic and energetic about what they want Singapore to do, which is good, but at the same time they can be very demanding of what the state can do for them uh, as well because the state has the resources to help them. In the Asian century, this island state has become a vibrant business epicentre, delivering growth in an age of austerity. But this success lies in courting more foreigners and the wealthy. For a country that has no natural resources, pretty much, other than its own people, uh, I think this was a necessary deci decision that the government made uh, a few years ago, uh, and it's something that uh, has served the economy well. Foreigners will be part of our, of our culture, will be part of our lives for a long time. And one of the questions that we are asking as Singaporeans now is, uh, can we live with this? How do we uh, accept this? And how do we blend those two and, and make sure that people still remain happy and still feel a sense of being rooted to Singapore? Singapore's Prime Minister once said, an inclusive society is one where everyone benefits from the nation's progress, has a sense of belonging, and a real chance to move up. The challenge is balancing these ideals and the pursuit of economic growth in one of the world's richest cities.